Titans, go! Talk fans, welcome back to Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back for the last time this summer in Doom Manor as we get ready to throw the curtains over the furniture, board up the windows, and uh, raid the fridge. And uh, we're ready to talk the season one review. And I'm here, of course, with my Titan Talk co-host, Jesse Jackson. Welcome back to Titan Talk once again. Hello, Charles, but I'm not the big deal. The big deal oh, you're is... Always, you're always a big deal. You're no, the biggest no, no, deal. No, 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 no. Our big deal is our special guest host joining yes. us. Yeah, so if you remember way back here about uh, around episode 23, 24, somewhere in there, we did a little Titan Season 1 review with a certain DJ Nick from Milan, Italy, and uh, DJ Nick back in Doom Manor, ready to talk the Doom Patrol Season 1 review. So welcome back to Titan Talk, DJ Nick. Hey, guys. And, well, I have to say thank you so much for the compliments here. You, well, I will give you a word of advice. It's not a good idea to give a DJ a big head. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have your camera off, so we can't see how big your head is getting. Exactly. So. <laughs> right now, as I said, you know, well, thank you very much for that lovely, lovely introduction. And I'm really looking forward to uh, this recap with you. We had a great time when we uh, did the recap for, for Titans, and so I'm sure this will be uh, just as fun. Yes, and yeah. uh, of course, everybody, you know, DJ Nick is uh, the host of the Whiskey and Cigarette Show, which I hope all of you are checking out, and uh, if not, shame on you, <laughs> but uh, he's always kind enough to help us out here and, and on other podcasts, like Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast that Jesse and I do, so um, I'm definitely looking forward to this, and I'm definitely looking forward to getting Nick's take on uh, Doom Patrol. I'd like to know what uh, what uh, you're thinking, so... Um, so just right off the bat, in general topics, Nick, uh, what's your been, what's your, uh, what's your evaluation of the season, this first season? Well, Charles, if you recall when you and I were actually talking um, Doctor Who last time, I mm -hmm. did say there was a lot to talk about. I kind of gave a little bit of a cliffhanger there, saying <laughs> there would be a lot to discuss. Well, here you go. Here's your, here's your forum. <laughs> exactly. Now we now we get to unveil that. I have to say. I was, no, I was not expecting a show like this, to be honest. I mean, I thought it would be in the vein or similar to Titans, but boy, was I wrong. I mean, this was just, I, I, I could not probably even equate it to another show because it had a little bit of uh, the 1930s movie Freaks. It had a little, bit, a little bit of David Lynch in it. It had right. a little bit of Deadpool in it. It had a little bit, a little bit of X-Men in it, but it was its own thing. But I could see these influences in it. And I absolutely loved it from the more darker moments to the very lighthearted moments too. I think it was a very interesting show. And I, and I was absolutely blown away by this first season. Excellent. Yeah, well now, said. Now, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, this was, I think Charles, because he was a fan of the comics, had a little bit more of a thought what it could be. Right. But as we've talked about, you know, he has been over the moon of how well they have represented this comics and the series. Now, Nick, I'm kind of wondering, have you, were you at all familiar with the Doom Patrol from DC Comics? Uh, had you read any of their stories, particularly Grand Morrison's run? I have to be honest, I oh, before the, the, the series started, I actually grabbed a few issues of the Grant Morrison comics just to get a feel of what I was get, what I was getting myself into. Right. I'm not I'm not widely read on the subject, but being enjoying most of what Grant Morrison has given us, mm -hmm. I, I particularly enjoyed this because we know the guy can sometimes go a little bit off the deep end. Just and a little bit. Just a little bit. Yes. 
I mean, sometimes he does ask us to do to take some pretty big bounds in his stories. Um, but uh, but in this case, I thought it re did reflect at least the, the issues that I read. It did partly reflect um, what we got to see on screen, especially uh, Crazy Jane, I think, was very well represented in this particular series as, as compared to a comic counterpart. Yeah, exactly. I, I think she was very well adapted for this television series. And mm. uh, Diane Guerrero does a masterful job uh, with all those various personas. And I'm sure we'll get into that a lot, but uh, oh, but she's yes. a, she's a phenomenal phenomenal acting talent, and uh, obviously this is her big breakout. I'm sure she's going to go on to do a lot of bigger things in addition to this series. I'll be very surprised if she does it because she obviously has the range for it. Oh yes, for sure. Yeah, I mean th I do have a lot to say about Crazy Jane, but like you said, uh, Charles, we'll get into it. You know, there's a time <laughs> and place for everything. <laughs> All right, and. Uh, now, uh, Jesse, one of the things that um, I know, obviously, we talked about a lot that uh, you were coming into this kind of pretty much cold. You had read a few Doom Patrol stories here and there, like in the back of like uh, old 80 page giants reprints and whatnot. But you weren't all that familiar with the team. Uh, they had appeared, you know, uh, there was that kind of search for the Doom Patrol and the new Teen Titans where um, – Cliff Steele, Robot Man, is found in the jungle, and the Titans find him, the new Teen Titans, and then uh, they track down the the modern that at the time the modern inter incarnation of the Brotherhood of Evil. But that was basically about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, had very little um, understanding of what what I was getting into, and just so happy that someone was able to make it accessible yet still weird enough to kind of embrace the roots. Uh, it was really well done. Yeah, and one of the things I, coming at as a fan, I really appreciated was that they didn't just draw from the Grant Morrison era. They drew all the way back to the 1960s original Arnold Drake, Bruno Pramani Doom Patrol run that – started off in a title called My Greatest Adventure, and then that eventually became the Doom Patrol's first ongoing title. And the fact that, you know, that it, it, it's incorporating so many different elements, um, you got a lot of, uh, you know, Morrison's run, but you also get like a little bit of the 70s Doom Patrol, and, um, you know, just uh, and, uh, and just little nods here and there. And, with, uh, and then also it develops its own mythos. And it's not beholden to the comic. It just kind of takes a lot of cherry picks little elements and kind of in, uh, incorporates them into its own new mythology, mythos. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really kind of dig that. So uh, uh, let's run down the characters and uh, run down some characters. And uh, Nick, this would be a great chance for you to, to kind of gush about your favorite characters of the, of the series. <laughs> well, I mean, it is a, a tough one to choose, but I think, you know, we, we mentioned you, that before. You, I, yeah. Do you have a favorite? I do. Yes, all I, right, I, all right, all right. I do. All right. All right. So so let's talk first. Um, now, obviously, we had the we were introduced to Doom Patrol um, in the uh, episode, of course, the Doom Patrol mm -hmm. in Titans season one, episode four. Uh, the only real carryover from that um was um, uh, April Bowlby as Rita Farr, a.k.a. Elasta Woman. And then we had kind of the voices of Negative Man and Robot Man, Cliff Steele and Larry Trainer, um, of course voiced by Matt Bomer and uh, Brendan Fraser in the Titans episode as they knew this series was coming up. So um, – so let's for the, let's talk about those three characters first because that's essentially what we were kind of introduced to, and uh, so Jesse, let, 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 actually let's go with Nick first on this. All right, Nick, what do you what do you think about um, the core the core of the Doom Patrol, Negative Man, um, Elastic Woman, and uh, Robot Man? Well, they were very interesting characters because once again, I've never encountered characters just like these. I mean, there's I, I the first impetus that I had was possibly something that I could compare maybe to Watchmen to a certain degree because maybe the strangeness and because the disenfranchised spirit that these characters have because they already start off with the fact of we are not superheroes. 
which I think already speaks volumes about that. And I think it, it and rarely do you get characters that are so deep. I mean, it's just it's not just the hero's journey of I have to save the world, I have to do this, I have to do that, etc. Um, but there's so much more behind it, which I thought was incredible, especially when it came to Negative Man, because rarely do you see something on screen or a character portrayed like that who is trying to, one, deal with his with his sexuality, and right. at the same time right. trying to find his place in the world. Um, that When I said there was a little bit of a reminder of um, old horror movies, uh, or should say particularly controversial movies, it made me think, for example, David Lynch's The Elephant Man, for right. example. There was that kind of hint of that, I feel. Um, so, yes, and, and Matt Boomer and Matthew Zuck did great jobs on, but on, the Larry, on doing Larry Train. I mean, it was just, it's amazing. It surprised me that it was two people, you know, that it wasn't, you know, there was just the one person doing the same thing, the, the character as a whole. As it right. Was. Yeah, because we have it. In the case of, of Cliff and Larry, uh, there's essentially a voice actor and then there's a physical actor. And obviously we get Matt Boomer as the voice of Negative Man. Brendan Fraser does a great job as the voice of, of Robot Man, Cliff Steele. But we also get the physical actor of Matthew Zuck as Larry and Riley Shanahan as, as Cliff. And it, it's kind of a credit to both, both actors, I think, because one's able to give that physical performance, but um, the vocal actors have to match up with that and make it feel like it comes from them. And so, very true. So and, and that's obviously done in post when they do the the um, the uh, you know the the over audio overlay and um, and, uh, and it's a real credit to them. And I think in that, you know, sitting there in that audio booth that they're able to kind of kind of merge the voice with the physical actor in that way. Oh, yes. I mean, I mean, it doesn't usually always work so well, but the way, as you were saying, they match the mannerisms of the character with the mm -hmm. voice. Right. It was just an incredible job. And, you know, moving from uh, Negative Man to Robot Man, once again, the first thing that I thought of was Boris Karloff, because yes. he gave me the idea of very being much the sad Frankenstein, you know, the very sort of misunderstood creature in certain ways that he moved in certain situations. And that, that was the first thing that came to my mind was Boris Karloff. And to be honest, at first, I was not a fan of Robot Man, or rather, should we say, before he became Robot Man, because obviously, let's be honest, he's not the most likable guy. He's right. not exactly an ideal parent or an ideal husband. Um, but yeah, he's, been, he's he's basically a bit of a jerk. He's a bit of a douche. <laughs> and, uh, he really is. Yeah. And, it, and he only really becomes a better human being as a robot, which is one of the great ironies of his character is that um, he's a horrible human being, but now as a robot, he's he's much better uh, individual, and he's becoming he's learning more about himself, and he's having more empathy toward others. Very true. Yeah, and, and so I think he grew on me because initially I was like, how can I feel any sort of sympathy for this man? Right. Seeing the the way he's treated people and the way he's treated his family and such, but. As time grew on and he sort of realized and underwent that metamorphosis, I really appreciated him even more because the way he then ends up bonding with, with, with Jane and there's almost that father-daughter rapport. And I really appreciated that. And so that was another character that really grew on me. And well, when it comes to Elastar Woman, I have to say she was the one that annoyed me the most. It took a while for me to appreciate, but she. Well, it was it was kind of it was kind of hard. And then Jesse, you can talk about this if you want. That initially you had problems with her because you're kind of like, well, what is she doing? Uh, she's. Go ahead. Yeah, um, my biggest issue, and I, I um, is the not being able to control her body was getting irritated to me. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, let's let's go, let's go. But I think they had a good payoff to explain the psychological reasons why she was self-sabotaging herself. You know, it's, it's easy for us, and I think I talked about it in the podcast, where, um, you know, if you're not an alcoholic, just don't drink. You know, if you're someone who isn't struggling with weight, you know, just don't eat the chocolate cake. Um, but it's it, not that it's simple. A, yeah, it's not that easy if you're the one with the, with the uh, addiction or the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and it, and I think it's a again it's a credit to the great writing in this in this series that Rita's character goes such an incredible journey throughout this series 
this first season. Um, yeah. When we when she starts off, she's very reclusive, like Larry, and she's uh, she's all wrapped up in the past, her past, her big movie star past. She can't let it go, even after all these decades, and she has these obvious serious self esteem issues and guilt over the things like the the baby story, which we find out later and whatnot. And there's just all this baggage that she's got. And it's kind of, it's keeping her from growing as an individual. And over the course of her, basically her major character arc is that she evolves from that reclusive, like, I don't, don't just leave me out of it. I don't want to get involved type person into someone who actually becomes one of the major leaders of the team. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, and steps gets, is the one who steps up and gets everybody motivated to do the right thing. Yeah, and I do think, Charles, that um, this season, they've done a great job of combining a couple of storylines. One, the idea of them getting from we're every man is an island, we're not involved, we just want to sit here in our own sorrow and mm-hmm. be sorrow, right? Um, right. Uh, and to where they actually get engaged and kind of are there for each other and there for the chief and other people. We also get the search for the chief versus, um, and I say this with great love in my heart, the Titans first season really just felt like almost a setup totally. We had some story, but mostly it was, okay, how are we going to get this band together? Right, and it was it, – it seemed like, yeah, they were just trying mostly, like you said, setup. It was mostly getting these pieces together, but we never got to see them really do much of anything, right. especially, especially with only 11 episodes compared to Doom Patrol's 15. Yes. And it's only a four-episode difference, but I think Doom Patrol, I think overall, did a much better uh, handling of – getting a lot of disparate elements together mm-hmm. and producing that story. I agree. Now, some of it, you know, may be like completely out there as far as you're concerned, but, uh, but there was a lot of like, you know, there was a lot of different character arcs, a lot of growth, a lot of backstory introduced mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of changes for these characters over the course of these 15 episodes. And it just all came together in my opinion. I agree. Perfect. Perfectly. Absolutely. All right. Uh, And um, we talked a little bit about Larry's growth. Uh, Larry's big character arc is obviously he was he felt very much the outcast because uh, we've he comes from the 1960s. He was a test pilot. And in that climate, and especially being in the military, he was obviously it wasn't a very welcoming environment for homosexuality. Yes. And. He lived his life in the closet, and that's all he knew. And as a result, even after his accident, um, he just uses that as another reason to kind of isolate himself from the world and hide. And he has to be brought out. And that obviously is, I think, still a lot of work in progress. But compared to what he was here at the beginning of the season, compared to the end – uh, and he goes through a lot. He ends, he ends up reuniting with his lost love, John, as an old as an old man, and uh, it's in a very touching, you know, episode where he gets to say goodbye to John and kind of close that chapter on his life a little bit and come to terms with it. And I, I thought that was one of the more amazing things this series had done. Yeah, I think that's the beauty actually of this. Uh, another thing, the beauty of this season is the fact that. All these characters are not the same by right. the time episode 15 is done, <clears throat> which often might not be the case when you're dealing with this kind of subject matter. You know, because usually, OK, something might change slightly, but you won't have such a huge change in personality, in the way you view things, in just how you even perceive this, a particular character who, you know, I, I was mentioning about Elastor Woman getting on my nerves at first and being rather annoying because I right. felt she was kind of a bit hoity-toity and kind of very sort of uh, uppity. Yeah, but right. once you find out why she's that way and as the season progresses, you learn to understand that she's not trying to be uppity and arrogant. It's It hides. There's something more behind that. Right. There's more to her. She's, you know, she's obviously has depth. 
and she essentially created that Rita Farr persona for Hollywood for being for being famous. It's not who she really is. It's not even her real name, as we find mm-hmm. out through the course of the series. And so, um, and part of her her growth here in this season is that she has to come to terms with that and realize that's not that Rita Farr isn't the person she wants to be going forward. She wants to be something else. And uh, and it's a credit to her character that she finally makes that change, and it doesn't feel forced. And that's one and one of the things I really love about this is that all these little breakthroughs throughout the course they don't feel like okay we have to work this in. They feel natural. It feels like it flows out of the story each episode mm-hmm. and e- each episode circumstances. And a lot of the growth that you see in these characters would probably on most shows take like three, four or five seasons to develop. And here we get this in the course of a series, just a, a single first season. And it, and it flows so naturally. And I think, again, that's a credit to the writing and the, and the acting. Very true. I mean, there's definitely some very concise storytelling and just the way they're able to juggle the um, backstory and what's happening now without it ever being jarring, but always pushing the plot forward, even though we, we go back to see how so-and-so became, you know, the certain character. It's, and, and that is also a credit to them, because I think, for example, it was a big problem on Arrow at a certain point, is that whenever there would be a flashback, I would groan loudly, because... You, you like, and a lot of people, Nick. <laughs> as much as I love that show, but right. that was one of these big problems. Flashbacks can be a problem. With, these, with this particular se- this series, it was not because it was so flawlessly done. Yeah, and every, every and if you notice, compared to Arrow, every flashback mattered. Exactly. You know, it wasn't yes. just like it wasn't just like okay, we're going to introduce something and then we're going to tease it over the course that one thing over the course of the entire season. If it, it was introduced in the episode, it got a payoff later in the episode. It That's mattered. Right. And, that, and and Doom Patrol, I think, is a is a perfect example of how Arrow should have handled its flashbacks. It might Very think. true. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, the you know we we talked about. I originally was very unhappy with Larry, and I thought it was a little bit him being a homosexual. Like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did we really need to go there? And then once again, I felt like, oh wow, they they had a plan. There was a reason why they did this. Every flashback, every story line, they were weaving together the story that they wanted to tell, and it's a really good story. So uh, I I totally agree with that. Yeah, and the, and it's you know Larry's story with you know coming to terms with who he is. And being happy with that, learning learning how to be happy with that and comfortable with it, yes. to be open, to be out. Uh, and it's obviously something that's uh, very powerful and very relevant to today's society. And, oh, yes, uh, very much so. I actually did have a question for both of you, though. All right. How did you feel about the profanity? Did you feel at times it was excessive or did you feel it was fitting for the, for the series? I'll let Jesse answer that one first. <laughs> okay, I was going to let you go. Sir. So what's kind of funny is it didn't bother me at all. Um, I know there are people that, you know, curse that much. So it didn't bother me at all. And then very quickly it became who these characters were. These are someone mm. that, you know, ooh, you quite a little potty mouth. Um, you know, it's just without thinking – you know, they're just going to say that. So it didn't bother me at all. I I knew this was an adult show. I knew um, this was who those characters were. So it didn't bother me at all, Charles. Uh, as for me, mm-hmm. uh, we had I mean, we had talked about this earlier in yes. the season here. So we kind of talked this one a little bit. But um, generally, I you know I don't have the problem with profanity. I as a writer, I'm kind of I try to. You know, I'm encouraged to express myself creatively, and I don't want – I'm not inclined to restrict or censor myself. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I do think, though, for some people, you can use too much profanity, and it becomes – you get numb to it. It loses its emphasis. I think a good – I think a great, well-placed F-bomb 
can have a lot of impact. Versus when you, it's versus, just a crutch, yeah. Versus just a crutch. Now, the one exception to that here, I think, is Cliff, because with Cliff, he says the F bomb so so repeatedly. He is, is you know, he'll go off like there was this great epic rant he had in the in the series finale where he's just going the effing painting and the effing this and F and F and F and <laughs> this and it's hilarious in the delivery. And I think it's a credit to Brendan Fraser because it's something that could be just so like tune a lot of people out, but in his delivery, it's hilarious. And just the idea that, okay, you've got this big robot guy swearing like he's, you know, uh, a sailor back in the, you know, in, in, in you know, olden times and, and, and just, he's just swearing up a storm but it's kind of hilarious. At least I found it that way. Now, a lot of people might not, mm-hmm. but personally, I thought it was, and, and it, it, it gave him his persona. And you kind of like, in a lot of times, now that you knew how Cliff would react, you almost kept like looking like something would happen and you immediately look over at Cliff and you were like, okay, waiting for him to unload with a bunch of F-bombs in response <laughs> because you knew how he would react to that given the situation. You know, another thing yeah, I exactly. thought... Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nick. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Jesse. So another thing I was thinking of, um, you know, in in early Kevin Smith work, there was a, there were people would complain about how much profanity um, his characters um, used, and he, you know, made the comment, "This is how my friends talk," um, and. Um, so I kind of thought of that too. That this is because um, you notice not all of them cuss that much, but it's Cliff and Jane a little bit more. Right. Um, that is just, and especially depending on Jane's persona. But uh, yeah. yeah, it. it yeah, baby, I, I, baby doll doesn't swear so much for some reason. Go yeah, figure. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Get out hammerhead and you're in for trouble. Exactly. exactly. Hammerhead yeah. it gets a little tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But um, all right, so let's talk some about other characters. Um, we should probably obviously talk about Jane, Diane Guerrero, Crazy Jane. Uh, let's talk about Vic and Joven Wayne, Joven Wayne, and um, and uh, the Chief, Doctor Niles Calder, played of course by. Timothy Dalton of James Bond fame and lots of other great things. So, uh, so guys, what do you think? What do you think? Let's start with Jesse this time. Uh, what do you think of Crazy Jane and uh, and or Cyborg and the Chief? So I think that, um, and I think the reason this show is so wonderful is depending on what day you ask me. I will tell you which one a different person is my favorite character, but um, you know Jane is consistently um, it's so much fun watching the actor perform. I love the different personalities, the um, the different personas, and and so and how wild that is. You know, I've told you one of my favorite episodes is when we were in the underground. And mm-hmm. seeing all the different actors coming in to play the personas, so I love that. I love the. Um, while I I I am a fan of her story, even though it's a horrible story, you you do not want that to happen to anyone. But to have that explained and well it's done, and the reason why it happened is um, while horrible, a, a great story. Um, I think the chief is a little bit of a jerk. Um, you know, I said I did, that th- I for did the try beginning. To, I did, yes, I did try to warn you yeah. about that. And um, you know, and I and I continue to feel that way. Uh, I don't know if he absolutely was worth, uh, you know, having to go look for him, but they decided to. Um, and then, um, you know, you and I had a really interesting discussion about cyborg at times can be very childish uh, but it's the relationship with his father his father and him it's a very complex relationship and so um i like that about them um he's you know he's not my favorite character but i do think he is um it, it was him being in there was an important part of the show 
for nothing else, we wouldn't have covered it if he had not been in there. Well, yeah, the he's just, the Titans. Yeah, he's essentially our Titans connection to this. Yes. And because um, we get to talk Cyborg, and hey, he's part of the Titans. So, yeah, yeah. it worked out really well. All right. Um, so, Nick, what did you think of these three characters? Okay, I mean, well, <laughs> I'll try and... I'll try and keep it as concise as possible. Go for, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> but, yeah, less, the more you talk is the less I have to talk, and everybody <laughs> likes that. So, <laughs> Okay, well, first off, when it comes to Crazy Jane, mm -hmm. I thought I had seen some incredible acting work when I'd seen um, McAvoy in Split and right. in Glass. Because I thought to myself, to be able to handle those kind of personalities and just switch it on and off constantly, that is the mark of a great actor. But uh, Diane took it to another level. That was the whole thing. He set the bar, and right. she basically raised it. Um, and uh, it's incredible how well she is able to do that, because I'm sure there are not many actors or actresses who can pull it off with such panache and to the point where we believe it. It's not, um, it doesn't in any way uh, make us feel, you know, we, it, it, it's 100% convincing. And that's what I loved about it. Uh, not to mention, as, as Jesse was saying, her backstory and the reason why she is the way she is and why also her personality is very standoffish when it comes to, to uh, bonding with other people, even though Robot Man does his best to reach out to her, but she continues to be standoffish for quite some time. And the idea of the underground, I love that because once again, to make a uh, the connection to Split, it made me think of the light, which is a similar concept that mm -hmm. uh, the character of of, uh, of McAvoy has in Split, where the character the personalities take the light. So uh, for, you know they stand in the light and they, you get that change of personality. Right. But when we actually got to see the underground, my jaw hit the floor. I said, "We're seriously getting to see the underground." I mean, it was. Mind-blowing, and I yeah. love that. Um, Timothy Dalton, okay, I must admit, I am not a Bond fan, and I've probably watched one Bond movie in my entire life. So, naughty me, but that's just the way it is. That's okay, not, your, not, it's not everybody's cup of tea, that's not right. But, um, obviously, I loved him when in Doctor Who, I loved him in um, Penny Dreadful, and I very much likened his performance in this show to what he did in Penny Dreadful, because the character was kind of that father figure with, um, a dark agenda. Yeah. And uh, so I really love that. And I, I agree with Jesse. I can't have sympathy for this man. I mean, it's just like uh, I, I well, especially after the, big, after the big revelation that uh, we find out. Yeah, he's uh, responsible for the Doom, all the Doom Patrol's accidents and their their creation. Exactly. I mean, at first I was all for let's help. Let's save this guy because he helped these unfortunate individuals to deal with their problems. Right. Then when we find out he is the creator of these problems, like, um, no, I don't think I want to save you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and Cyborg, I agree, he does tend to be childish at times, but I would at a certain extent blame it on the youth of the, also the character, it's himself, because he's not yet the Cyborg we know who then becomes a member of the Justice League and everything else. I mean, I believe they mention that he's getting there but he's right. not, you know, because obviously they, they, they pick on him saying, you know, Batman would do this better or, super, or why don't you call Superman or this kind of thing. And but I like his his the, 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 the job that um, the actor portrays of Cyborg. And I really love the the relationship between Silas and Vic. It's a very interesting relationship. It's a very multi-layered relationship. And I mean, it can sometimes come off as being an overbearing father, but you believe that he, ma he really does love his son, even though maybe at times he's, he finds it hard to show how much he loves his son or he finds it difficult to express his love. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. And uh, very well said by both of you. I totally agree. Um, as for me, Jane, um, obviously... Coming from the Grant Morrison comics, uh, one of the things I was really hoping, I wasn't sure we were going to get, was the episode in the underground, Jane Patrol, because it's actually based, and we talked about this, uh, Jane Patrol is based on an issue by Grant Morrison and Richard Case. Uh, it was Doom Patrol, Volume 2, Number 30, and it's called Going Underground. And the story of the episode Jane Patrol is essentially a uh, – a kind of a sort of semi based on that comic book story. And it's my favorite comic book story of Morrison's run. 
I was really hoping for it because there was such a great payoff. You got a lot of information about without it, it, it's interesting. We don't get a lot of details, but we kind of get to know Jane the horrible experience she went through. Uh, we find out, you know, it's confirmation as we suspected in the TV series that yes, she was sexually abused by her father, molested. And as a result, that's probably why she, her personality's fragmented and as a way to cope with that trauma. And here we, we get, and it was so wonderfully represented in the comic by Richard Case. And here we get to see in this episode, Jane Patrol, we got to see, to go into the underground, we got to see physical representations of all those personalities inside Jane. Some look like her, like Driver, Driver 8, uh, my per- favorite personality from the comic, and um, others don't, like Scarlet Harlot or Black Annis or whatever. Um, the, you know, just that, you know, just whatever, depending on, on just how things are and, w- and which actress wants to play that particular role, I think. And it it just did such a masterful job, and I was so happy that they did it, they adapted it, and they did it well. And uh, I think it's my favorite episode of the entire season. Yeah, perfect. And as for um, um, the chief, uh, I knew, again, from the comics that he was a bit of a bastard. Uh, Morrison had introduced this concept that he was uh, responsible for the Doom Patrol's creation. Um a little more noble – it's presented here a little bit more well-intentioned. I want to say noble, more well-intentioned, you know, but mm-hmm. the road to hell is obviously paved with good intentions. Um, and in the comic, he was – it's basically – it comes out during the course of the chief being revealed as being insane. And here it's more of like this dark secret that the chief is trying to keep from everybody. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Nobody in his quest to torture – the chief, for reasons we still don't know, no, don't really know why he want he's so fo- fixated on the chief. Um, he he reveals this secret, and as intended, it is it basically blows up the entire apple cart. You know everything, everything that everybody knew was wrong, and all their trait, whatever faith they still had in the chief, is completely obliterated by this point. And as a result, it makes a lot of conflict and also drives uh, their character act interactions with one another going forward. And I'm looking forward to seeing that in season two. Oh, yes. I think there's definitely a lot to look forward to. And I think that they they really blur the lines, which is great, because, Mm -hmm. you know, the so-called good guys are not necessarily 100 percent good. They are, you know, gods with feet of clay, as it were, while even the villains themselves are not completely evil, as it were. There is depth to them. That's why I say it's not your standard superhero fare where good is good and bad is bad, which is great because humans are not that way. You know, we're not entirely all good and we're not entirely all bad, I feel. So I think it was also, it humanizes the characters that much more. And and as horrible as the chief is, and yes, he is horrible at times, um, he does try to look out for the team. Mm. Yeah. And he's he's also trying to protect his daughter, as we find out, because it's ultimately revealed that Dorothy Spinner, uh, one of the characters from Grant Morrison's run, is his daughter in this continuity. And he's trying to keep her secret because she has these vast imaginative powers and these powerful psychic powers. And he's essentially trying to protect her from the world and also the world from her. And so, so he, you know, he is, he, again, it's, it's well-intentioned. It's just the quite his methods, I think, are questionable about how he proceeds with that. Yes. yes. Um, and, you know, they'll talk about, you'll do anything to protect your children. Um, so I, I get that persona and uh, I'm certainly not judging him, mm-hmm. uh, but it just, it, especially and we don't know that at the time. Uh, it makes her a very complex character, and as you said uh, very well, Nick, he isn't somebody that you're going to embrace um, mm. at all. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, as for Vic, 
Uh, obviously, I came, you know, like I was a fan of Cyborg because of the new Teen Titans. That's how Jesse and I got into knowing one another was through our mutual love of the Teen Titans. So um, I was a little skeptical at first when they decided to make Cyborg a member of the Doom Patrol because he hadn't been that in the comic books. He's either been with the Titans or they moved him into the Justice League when Jeff Johns and the, the new 52 happened in 2011. But, um, you know, ultimately that set him up to be in the Justice League movie and so on. So I wasn't sure how they were going to approach it, but I like how they did it. And I like Joven, Joven Wade, who Jesse and I knew from Doctor Who because he played a character named Riggsy. Yeah, that's right. In, in uh, episodes like Flatline. And uh, he was really good in that. And, and, um, and Face the Raven. And um, so we kind of knew of him. But obviously here he's playing a much different character than Riggsy in Doctor Who. And, uh, you know, and he, he's, he's very likable in the sense that he's the traditional hero and that he's that contrast for the rest of the Doom Patrol kind of being these misfit superheroes. He's yeah. the one trying to, like, get everybody focused and, hey, we should have meetings and go off and we'll do this and we'll battle the bad guys. And, you know, he's trying to corral – he's essentially herding cats. and. Yeah. And and the, and all the problems ensues from that, and they have obviously a lot of them, especially um, Cliff. They butt heads with him because that's not who they are, and there's that kind of personality conflict. And ultimately, though, they all kind of learn how to coexist and respect one another, and come together as a family, to the point where ultimately Vic kind of chooses the Doom Patrol over his own father. Especially yes, after, he does. especially after, especially after various revelations come out, uh, especially the fact that uh, we find out that Silas chose Vic, um, chose to save Vic over his own wife, and um, so essentially Silas is a little complicit in his mother's death and let um, Vic kind of shoulder the blame for that. Which I've personally kind of found kind of reprehensible, and I'm, it was very sympathetic toward Vic. And we, Jesse and I, kind of got in that little debate about that. Um, because, you know, that uh, whether you come from the father perspective of like, hey, I did this for a reason, uh, versus the son's perspective of like, how did you, why did you treat me like that and let me feel that? You could have kept that, you know, you could have told me the truth. Yeah, and then and then you wonder why I have trusting trust issues with you. But yeah. you know, kind of a callback to something Nick and no one else has heard yet. Though by the time this comes out, they may have. Yeah. Um, Charles and I discussed earlier today Krypton, and there is a scene where um, the main character is unhappy. Se Segal, yeah. Yeah, that um, no spoilers because you know just in case, <laughs> but. Um, Adam Strange does not give him information that he thinks would be very important. And we, Charles and I talked about, when's a good time to tell that? So I kind of feel the same thing that Vic's dad had the same kind of, okay, when would this be a really good time to tell you this? So I, I just, well, but then, and in my argument as well, it's never really a good time. You just kind of mm -hmm. have to, yeah, you kind of exactly. have to rip, rip the bandaid off and right. tell. Yes. Yeah. So, but, yes. uh, but that's me. So, uh, but uh, all around, I think there's you know a lot of great and you know obviously the team comes together and uh, like I said becomes this this kind of uh, misfit family, and mm -hmm. because everybody else in their life has kind of essentially let them down or died, and uh, so they kind of all they have are each other in this in this predicament that they're all in. All right, um, now let's uh, let's talk about our big bad. Let's talk about Alan Tudyk as Mr. Nobody. Eric Morden, uh, we find out, is originally applied to be a member of the Brotherhood of Evil back in the day. Didn't go so well. And uh, so he ends up becoming this like insanely powerful being, Mr. Nobody, thanks to the help of von Fuch, Heinrich von Fuchs, a uh, Paraguayan uh, ex-Nazi scientist. So uh, what's everybody's thoughts about Mr. Nobody? And we'll start with Nick. Well, I have to say he is a brilliant villain. He absolutely is an incredible villain. And once you, you've never seen anything quite like this because he breaks the fourth wall, which mm -hmm. you don't get 
in other shows. Usually he doesn't address, you know, you don't have these kind of shows where the villain addresses the audience. And uh, that's why it made me think a little bit of Deadpool when, you know, even in the comics, where someone's Deadpool turns to the reader and says something and the characters look at him and say, who are you talking to? He's like, I'm talking to them, you know? But, um, <laughs> and, I, and I think that's absolutely brilliant. But not to mention, I, the, the man's voice is incredible. I mean, he could read the phone book to me and I'd be very happy to hear his voice, I tell you. And not to mention, I, 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 I've yet to see this, but I know that he voices Yago in the, in the Aladdin movie. So right. I'm really looking forward to hearing how he will portray Iago, because I think he's uh, the perfect choice for that particular character. But in general, um, I love the fact that not only does he break the fourth wall, but he's also as multifaceted and multidimensional as his character, because he doesn't just he's not evil for evil's sake. There's more to it than that. And also the fact that he comes from a sad past himself always been a failure, his, his wife's not particularly happy with the way he's, he's been doing things, she loses faith in him. So we can almost sympathize with him to a certain degree because it's like the guy's been down on his luck. He, granted, he, he decides to go the, not the best route to solve his problems. But, um, <laughs> you know, going, going to ex-Nazis, bro, that's probably not the best solution. But um, other than that, I, I really enjoyed him, and I think he makes for a great uh, nemesis. And the, the the way that him and Timothy Dalton work off each other is great. They just go. I could actually see them off offset going out for a beer because I can tell they really actually enjoy being in each other's company. They, they did have though, really good. They have really a great on screen chemistry, didn't they? Exactly, and I feel that like it often happens when you have you know the good guy and the bad guy who hate each other on screen, but off screen they're hanging out and they're the, the best of friends. So I kind of got that vibe from them. But yeah, I really really enjoyed Mr. Nobody. And uh, what did you think, Jesse? Of Mr. Nobody? Yeah, I loved Mr. Nobody. I, I thought he was the best villain ever. Um, just so much fun and kind of a little bit of uh, craziness, a just the right amount of weirdness. Mm -hmm. um, I love the joy he had when he's talking to um, the audience, when he kind of self-references, oh, finally, I've been waiting for this to get over. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm... He has just been perfect. He has been such a joy to watch. Yeah, and obviously, uh, Jesse and I, we've, we've known Alan Tudyk because we were both Firefly fans and you know, and the movie Serenity, the sequel. And I knew I mean, Alan Tudyk, he, he did such a great job in uh, Rogue One, a Star Wars story, as K2SO. So I knew you know, he had such great comedic timing. And that wasn't that wasn't an issue. What I loved about it, um, this depiction of, of Mr. Nobody, was that they kind of carried the character's ability to to break through the fourth wall, like Nick said, and talk addressed directly to the audience. So it's almost like the audience is brought in on what Mr. Nobody's thinking. It's like instead of just talking to himself. Uh, he's actually ha engaging the, the audience and gets you involved. So you feel like you're part of the story a little bit because he's talking directly to you. And, uh, and that's the great thing about asides is that um, it, it gets the, the viewer or the reader involved like that. And um, he's not your typical supervillain. He's, he, he, you know, you don't, you sometimes you get like, like you said, Deadpool, uh, you get a, you get a, a hero, that, that can kind of break through the fourth wall. David Addison on Moonlighting and Matty Hayes, if you're a fan of that show from back in the 80s, uh, they did a lot of fourth wall breaking. But, um, you know, it's it's very rare you get a villain to do that. And mm. and as a result, I think I made Mr. Nobody a much more unique villain. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was glad that uh, this character was represented so well um, from the comic books, again, from Morrison's run. Uh, you can obviously tell that this that the Morrison era was obviously their their heavy focus, and then everything else was kind of built around that. Um, but as a result, you know, it just it 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 made such a for a great um, 
foil for the Doom Patrol. And like you said, those those scenes in the white space between uh, Timothy Dalton and Alan Tudyk, where they're just kind of the bannering back and forth and trying one, trying to outwit the other and, you know, like manipulate the other. And uh, it just made for some really fascinating watching. Very much so. Yeah, he was just a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and, so, and obviously yeah. I don't think we've seen the last of him. If as we we find a left off in the final episode that uh, he's trapped in this painting uh, with the Beard Hunter, and I'm sure Jesse's not as thrilled about the Beard Hunter. <laughs> but, you might have uh, some company there, Jesse. <laughs> uh, Thank you. So, so, so Nick, Nick, not a fan of the Beard Hunter, uh, played by, of course, Tommy Snyder. In this series. No, he, let's say he's not my favorite, but yeah. um, so so how so <laughs> let's just so let's let's talk about that. So how grossed out were you by that hairball scene where he swallows the chief's beard hair in that bathroom scene? You know what the bad thing was? I was actually having dinner while I was watching that. Episode. <laughs> oh, horrible! <laughs> yeah, so I like you know there I am happily. Uh, and it was probably pl- something, probably something like pasta or something. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. I, funnily enough, it might be, seem terribly stereotypical, but yes, I was having pasta, and uh, you know, there I was happily enjoying my, you know, the sauce that I've taken ages to make and everything. I was like, fine, I can tuck in and enjoy. What do I have to see? A guy swallowing a piece of beer, and I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh no, I've just suddenly lost my appetite. How do they pop to put this in the fridge and eat it later? Um, but aside from that, he just would get in- incredibly annoying. I just. I, the way he acted and the way he carried himself, and I just really wanted somebody to punch him in the face. I'm sorry to say that, but I just really felt. No, that, I, that's kind of the character, though. He was annoying, and he was. I guess he did a great job a, because he makes himself annoying. Yeah, he if was he's annoying. I mean, he means he's done his job. Yeah, well, he did his job then because yeah, that's kind of who he is. He essentially, he was a parody of the Punisher, where you know instead of hunting people, hunting bad guys, he goes out and hunts beards. And but he, but he sees himself as this big macho guy, you know, but even though he's like watching like runway videos and staring at men's magazines and whatnot. So it's 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 kind of um, self-deprecating. And yeah. but uh, but uh, but um, obviously he's not going to be everybody's uh, cup of, of beard hair, I guess. No, <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, I, I, understand, I understand. And I, res- whole, I respect that. I respect that. Yeah. I mean, I understand the whole parody thing. But for example, I then I much more preferred Willoughby Kipling as a parody to Constantine. Right. I mean, I preferred him much more. I would have gladly have seen more of Willoughby Kipling than of the Beard Hunter. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and ho- hopefully we will, because he does appear in other Doom Patrol stories. So um, in the comics. So uh, hopefully, yeah, let's let's talk about Mark Shepard a little bit. So now that you brought him up, it's a good segue. Um, Will it be Kipling? Obviously, we talked about this in the episode that in the comics he was created because at the time Grant Morrison wasn't allowed to use John Constantine. And um, so Morrison came up with this kind of version of Constantine, uh, much more of a, more of the, you know, the offbeat magician type. Um much more into little strange artifacts and whatnot. And um, so I want to get – Jesse, let's talk about you. I know you're a big Mark Shepard fan. Again, a lot of Doctor Who connections in this in this series. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so so what did you think of Mark Shepard as Willoughby Kipling? You know, I, I just loved him. I thought he was really, really perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that we're – um, you know, kind of the magic, the kind of not just um, doing wax on, walks off the way Doctor Strange does it in the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was actually some mechanics, um, kind of like Art- um, artifacts. Yeah, um, the Jim Butcher. You know, series. Oh yeah, yeah, the Dresden Files. Yeah, yes, which I'm um, a big fan of. Yeah, yeah really. um, loved that TV series, and um, so I think that's uh, kind of neat to see that. And um, once again, Mark Shepard is so interesting; it's always fun to see him. So yeah, that's you know, I just was really glad to see it. And how about you, Nick? What did you think of, of uh, Mark Shepard as Kipling? Well, first off, it's always wonderful to see so many familiar faces from Doctor Who. I mean, because we, you know, as 
you know, you two fellow Hoovians of mine, you know, I think we felt right at home seeing all these, you know, familiar faces from that show. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a, I really enjoy Constantine. I really actually enjoy the TV series, Constantine, and I'm still very much trying to recover from that show being cancelled. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, and as, as the f- former co-host of Dangerous Habits, the Constantine podcast, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm glad they worked him into Legends of Tomorrow because I was so glad to see him again. And that's why probably I enjoyed uh, Willoughby Kipling so much because loving the Constantine character, at least they let this guy smoke, you know, because they're always right. finding an excuse to not let Constantine smoke. I mean, let, let the guy smoke at least one cigarette. Come on now. Well, actually, <laughs> Matt Ryan did try to did work in a few uh, cigarettes here and there on, on the TV series. But again, that was NBC, a network TV series. Uh, compared to DC Universe, which obviously they can get a lot away with a lot more and be more it, it, faithful. Yes. Exactly. No, and, and plus, I immediately, immediately went to Constant because, of course, you know, the, the coat and, of course, the, the strong British accent. And just, right. The, the, it, attitude, the attitude. Exactly. I mean, it was John Constantine to a T, but even more exaggerated and even more strange, maybe less of a punk compared to, to, to Constantine. But I really, I really enjoyed his interaction with the characters, and I was so hoping he would stay on longer. I mean, I believe he only did two episodes on yes. Doom Patrol. Yeah, yeah, it was a two-part storyline. Yeah, the um, oh, was it here? The uh, yeah, Cult Patrol and Paw Patrol, the the fourth and fifth episodes of the season. The, and I really, really hope they'll bring him back for season two because he was really one of the really cool recurring characters. And plus. As even Jesse was saying, it's always wonderful to see this guy. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed him in The Impossible Astronaut and in Day of the Moon, of course, from Doctor Who. So whenever he's on screen, it's always a pleasure to see him. Yeah, well, like I said, uh, Grant Morrison did a couple more storylines with him, including like he's a major player in Morrison's final epic storyline uh, during his run. So uh, we should hopefully see him again. Fingers crossed, as long as Mark uh, Shepard's schedule holds up. Good. That, uh, yeah, maybe with supernatural ending, uh, maybe that'll be that'll help out a little bit too. Yeah. Hopefully. So, uh, but yeah, so Mark, more Mark Shepard is always a good thing, and uh, I, I kind of enjoyed seeing him because he plays, you know, compared to Matt Ryan's Constantine, uh, Shepard's Kipling seems to have a little bit more mileage on him. You know, like he's kind of been yeah. a little bit more around the block, so he's kind of a little bit more jaded, if that's possible, than Constantine. And uh, and that comes through, I think, in his performance. And he makes him much more sardonic. And uh, he's got a lot of great lines and snappy comebacks with everybody. And it was a lot of fun. All right. Um, let's talk about some other characters. Let's talk about uh, Darren Jones and the Bureau of Normalcy. Because they're kind of uh, some significant players, especially as we get dive into um, Larry's backstory when he was a prisoner of the ant farm. And uh, so, Jesse, what did you think of um, Darren Jones and in, in this the introduction of this uh, this group, this Bureau of Normalcy that is essentially uh, out? Their mission is to wipe out all things abnormal and exterminate them. Yeah, I um, it 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 was they were an interesting um, you know bad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have um, – I don't know if I wanted it, – it, I, I guess my problem – and not really a problem – is the um, – a little too close to home sometimes with the amount of prejudice and the amount of people trying to fight against what's – the quote unquote unnatural. So right. I think that's, I mean, it was a great villain, but I think if anything, that's what bothered me a little bit is that, Oh, this is a hitting a little too close to home. It on is it, something it, that it is should, a bit, uh, yeah, disturbingly relevant to our times right now. That, well said, Charles. Exactly. It's very relevant. Yes. Yeah. And how about you, Nick? what did you think of uh, the Bureau of Normalcy? I cannot but echo Jesse's words because B, I have to say it, it is very much a um, representation of the, the unfortunate, tumultuous political times we're going through and the ideas that are being perpetrated. And it's very sad to see certain ideas returning to where if right. it is different, it is considered 
evil. And I suppose I probably feel this myself. Look, being Jewish, I feel this a lot even more so. And that's why maybe it was a little bit disturbing for me to see this Bureau of Normalcy because those kind of images immediately came to my to my head, you know, of right. fascism, of, you know, if you are not like, you know, in such and such a way, you are slightly different or you, you know, profess a different religion or you or just that. And I mean, that, I think that's why maybe it was so um, disturbing and just almost so creepy because of that fact that it so mirrors society today and the political regimes that we are seeing throughout the world, unfortunately. So, um, but it, but it was brilliant. It was it was very good, and I think it was also a good social commentary as well. Because I think I believe these shows do need to do that. Maybe without hammering it too hard, but right. but saying you know wake up people, this is what is going on. Obviously, they took it to the extreme in this case, but I think it should, it, they're try, I think they're trying to leave a message of, this is what's going on, you know, you don't want to get to the point of where there is this situation, so I, I appreciate it more than anything for that. Yeah, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of criticism because uh, not you personally, hopefully, uh, but, you know, that the show will get criticism because yes, they're addressing certain political topics, and that a lot of people, they don't want to see that in their entertainment. And God forbid, yes, they, they actually are, are taught something about society and learn, kind of are asked to think, question what's going on in their society. And that's kind of what Doom Patrol does here. But I don't think they beat you over the head with it. Exactly. It's just more – just they kind of more focus on the repercussions of it and how it affects everyday people. Whether you view them as everyday people or not, it's people, living people, breathing people that, that are just trying to go about their day, live their lives, and just want to live a life of happiness and acceptance. And uh, unfortunately, there's people out there that don't want that to happen, unfortunately. And when Morrison created um, Darren Jones, and then he created this group called the Men from Nowhere, which in the TV series became the Bureau of Normalcy. Uh, and the ant farm, um, he came out of the times – he was coming out of the 80s with the Thatcher era and uh, in the UK. And um, you know, there's a lot of conservative voices that tried to stamp out homosexuality and, and anything unusual, different. And, uh, and sadly, what he wrote in the early 1990s is still plaguing us here as we approach 2020. And uh, it's, it's you kind think of, we would have evolved kind of, by then? You would think, and we we started to, and then we hit a really bad backslide. I think what it did, um, especially with the election of Trump in 2016, and this is just me speaking, um, mm -hmm. and it kind of like kicked over a rock, and all the roaches and bugs and evil things just crawled out from under that rock that were already there, and it and they they spread out into the world and into the in the spotlight. And they have their – they're having their moment in the sun. And, uh, and then it's kind of up to everyone to kind of take a stand against that and hopefully drive them back under the rock for a good while. You know, um, one of the other podcasts I listen to is the West Wing Weekly and where they are going through each episode of the West Wing, which is eight, nine years old. And some of the episodes – are still so relevant today, talking about immigration, talking about um, social justice. Um, so yes, it is, and I I like your image of um, it. You you knock over that rock, and all of a sudden these creepy crawly things go together. So mm -hmm. um, and I want to stress to, your point is really well said. They did not beat us over the head. I know some people feel like the latest season of Supergirl was too on the nose and kind of right. beating a social in, in justice. Your face. Yeah. 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 yeah, I didn't feel so, but I understand those people who do. Right. Um, so this doesn't especially, at all. Especially for a network show. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but, but I think it's just that, you know, that was pretty much, you know, a lot – in the 60s, remember you had shows like The Twilight Zone yeah. and The Outer Limits and all this that challenged you and tried to get you to think differently or at least expand your your ideology a little bit and and get you to think. 
And uh, that fell out of favor at some point. I'm not sure when, probably mm-hmm. during the 80s. And mm-hmm. it's struggled ever since to kind of come back so that when people <clears throat> try to bring out those ideas, story concepts that push those boundaries and get you to think, then it's like all of a sudden you have an agenda as opposed to just like, well, no, I'm just trying to get you to think about stuff. And some people view it that way. Some people don't. And uh, that's the that kind of battle that uh, creative types face, I think. Yeah, very true. I mean, but at the same time, I think that is what we want, because I think, you know, you're hoping that your audience is intelligent and you don't right. want to have to, you know, down talk to your, to your audience. And I think you want them to think, regardless of the of the subject matter you're dealing with, be it a political show, be it a superhero show, be it anything. I think it's important if there is a takeaway, if there is a moral lesson. Or if there is something that, you know, once you finish the show, once you've read that comic book, whatever, there is a takeaway. There is something that you can, like, close the book or turn the TV up and say, wow, that really made me think. And I think that is good storytelling and it's more profound. I mean, rather than have a show that's just wallpaper, you know, you want something that is a little more engaging, I feel. Granted, it might clash with certain people's ideologies. But at the end of the day, one could even say then that it's not a show for you. You can watch something else that might be more in in, you know, to, uh, more close to your ideology. Right. And I, th- and I think it's a credit to Doom Patrol that what, you know, a lot of people may come into this going, well, hey, uh, this is like a weird superhero show. I'll check this out. And they could have just phoned it in, mm. but they didn't. They, exactly. They, they, they address some rather, I mean, it, Think about the stuff they talk about here in this series, just this first season. They're talking about coming out and acceptance of homosexuality. They're talking about mental illness and mm. and um, dissociative identity disorder. Uh, they're talking about um, sexual harassment. We get that with Rita a lot. Mm. You know, with the like with the directors and and the mm. casting couch storylines. Um, you know, we get uh, you know the trust issues. We get. Um, Child abuse. Child abuse, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, obviously with Crazy Jane and her father, exactly. That's a, that's a big one that a lot of people just, you know, they get a little nervous when you start bringing that up. But I think it's important to talk about stuff like that because that's how you confront it and you face it and you can't deal with it if you're constantly running from it. Exactly. And I think it also gives value to these shows because you might have people who say, ah, oh, you know, superheroes shows – are just about, you know, bam, smack, pow, the good guy wins, right. r- walks into the sunset with the girl and everything else. And I think it also helps give these shows more credit. They're like, it is a superhero show, but it's more to it than just that. And I think we need that also to give value to what might, to what maybe in the eyes of a few might be seen as child's fare. Right. You know, something very safe and without any kind of, Consequence. Consequence. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Jesse, anything you'd like to add? No. Okay. (laughs) No, no. Uh, Yeah, he's probably like, uh, yeah, you guys are getting way too over my head. No, no, no. I agree. (laughs) I agree. I, I, yeah. Okay. We didn't want to get too deep into the woods, I guess. All right. Um, Let's see. Some other characters we could probably talk about. Uh, Flex Mentallo which is a fun character that gets introduced late in the series, I think. Uh, he's also a character created by Morrison, a uh, surprise, uh, played by David Chandler Long. And we talked, Jesse and I talked about how Flex was a kind of throwback to like the old um, Charles Atlas, you know, like, you know, build a, make a man out of Mac ads mm-hmm. where you had the guy that was getting kicked, his sand kicked in his face by this bully at the beach and he takes the Charles Atlas program and he's able to sock the bully in the jaw and get the girl. And he's the hero of the beach at the, you know, at the, um, in the, in the comic book ads back then, back in the day, way back in the day. And Morrison was a fan of those and created this character flex mental as a tribute to that. Um, so I know what Jesse's thinking about flex. Nick, what did you think about flex? I That's really it. enjoy. I really enjoyed every time Flex Mentallo was on screen. The man of think, muscle mystery. <laughs> exactly, and I think it was also great because it was a contrast to the the the, the Doom Patrol team members. Right. Because right. the fact that they are so dysfunctional, you know, they are 
they all have their issues and they either are, are disfigured or they have, you know, this, these kind of problems. And here comes this guy, you know, this, this perfect looking bound, guy. Yeah, exactly. Handsome, muscle bound, what have you. And he maybe portrays the idea of being more of the, shall we say, inverted commas, run of the mill superhero, as in, you know, incredibly buff, handsome and, you know, all the girls are fawning over him. And right. I think it was fun also for that reason. And also the fact that he is so good natured. You know, there's nothing that will irritate the guy. You know, when, the, <laughs> when you see Robot Man trying to get a rise out of him, there's just no way he could do it to kind of, to jog his memory. And um, and it's almost and it frustrates him to such a point where the guy destroys the the, the TV. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, and, that seemed like you know that seemed the only thing that really bothered him is like I can't watch my soap opera. Exactly, <laughs> but, like he takes that very serious. Yeah, and I love that. I think it, and uh, and uh, Devin Chandler Long did such a great job of, of portraying him. Mm-hmm. Um, and and because because you know you could have just played him straight as a straight strong man, you right. know, and that was it. But I think he also gave him charm and the fact that he is kind of almost so peace loving and such. I, I really really loved him, and I thought it was a great contrast. To kind of the gloom and doom we had, no pun intended, in the Doom Patrol itself. Yeah, and there was that great, there was that great hilarious scene in uh, Penultimate Patrol, the 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 uh, 14th episode of the season, where um, Flex is trying to get the team into white space. Yeah, and he gives everybody <laughs> in town a collective orgasm. <laughs> and and uh, and just when you thought you had seen everything to see mm-hmm. on this show at, by this point, that scene happened to the tune of Eric Carmen's "All by Myself," was hilarious in my opinion. <laughs> I, 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 I laughed. I laughed so hard at that scene. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it was it was insane. Yeah, but it's true. You thought you and had just seen like, and you just ca- and you're just watching this, going, I can't believe they went there. I can't believe they did this, and it's fa- <laughs> and I'm thinking it's fantastic that they went there. I was Absolutely. so happy. I just I I rolled with laughter at that. Um, that was and yeah, and uh, that kind of reminds me of Danny the Street. We should probably talk about mm-hmm. um, our sentient transvestite teleporting street Danny. Uh, again, another comic that uh, character from Morrison's run. Um, now Jesse obviously had no idea of. Danny going in, but uh, but I think that uh, he liked Danny. I as a character. love Danny. I was so happy. Um, the comparison of the bureaucracy of normal and Danny the street. Um, everything has to be normal. We have no room for anything outlandish. Uh, we're gonna just scrape. Uh, you know, Cliff, because he's an outdated robot, um, to acceptance to everyone, no matter where you're at. I mean, I liked um, the Beard Hunter as he was there on the street. Uh, you know, that... Dan- Danny even made the Beard Hunter tolerable. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and just... Um, and. That's how, the power of Dan- – behold the power of Danny. How creative is it that the idea that this um, object has a personality right. and is so accepting and loving, um, it's just great. Yeah, it's very, it's very positive. And, and one of the great things I think about Danny is that he is such a positive force. It's not like – like I told Jesse, there's, there's no ulterior motive with Danny. No. Uh, what you see is what you get. Um, he cares about the Dannysons, the people that he's kind of collected during his travels, adventures, whatever you want to call it. And they've they found a home on Danny, and as a result, he looks over them. You know, like he, he's you know, like without having any ulterior motive, he's protective of them, and just wants them to give them a, a safe haven, a safe space, if you will. Yeah. And uh, and I thought that was great. So Nick, what did you think about Danny? I totally agree with Jesse when he says the concept is just absolute genius because there's never been anything like the fact of a disembodied, you know, entity, but it's, right. which is actually a street, and, right. and it could go and it could go anywhere. Exactly. Not to mention the fact that through words you could feel the emotion. It's so weird because 
Like was, street, like street <laughs> signs and and like you know inflatable guys and exactly, whatnot. Exactly, all the neon lights, uh, street right. uh, signs, etc. <laughs> but the fact that when you know Danny sh- uh, showed disappointment or sadness, I have to admit I actually felt myself tearing up, and it was just words. And I think that is how potent that character was and how well it was portrayed. The fact that I could actually feel when you know Danny was happy or angry or upset to where, for example, when Flex Mentello shows up, he's like, Flex, how are you doing? And everything. I could actually feel just by the way the, the text came out, the guy was genuinely excited to see him. Um, and it was just, it blew my mind because I actually had to check myself saying, you do realize you're uh, reacting to words, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, and I think that was the genius about it because it, it was just something so different and the concept just so original yeah, uh, definitely. We have to have more of Danny as well, because it's such an incredible character and it's such a, a powerful one. That uh, And it's a great, uh, as, as Jesse was saying, it's a great opposition to the Bureau of Normalcy as well. So I loved it. Totally. Excellent. All right. Um, probably should start wrapping things up. Uh, is there any other characters anybody wants to talk about? Like that I missed, uh, like Ezekiel the Cockroach or Animal Vegetable Mineral Man or Admiral Whiskers? Or- the Animal Mineral Vegetable Man was just so silly that that kind of went off and they continued to see it. Um, you know, I I would love to see Cliff's daughter back next season. Mm-hmm. Um, Clara, yeah. Yeah, Clara. Played um, by Bethany and Lind. Yeah, a great, great, job. great. Great, um, you know, a lot of good supporting characters, and yep. uh, really looking forward to next season. All right, Nick, how about you? Any other characters you want to talk about? Well, though I, I guess we probably won't see more of him. I really enjoyed what we saw of, of von Fox as well. The, oh yeah, the whole Heinrich von Fox, yeah, F- Fugtopia. Exactly, the puppets and just the general creepiness of that world it was it was brilliant and the just the the whole that whole the the way he was portrayed i absolutely love that and I, I know we probably won't see him again but it was it was amazing and very rarely am i do i get sort of skin crawl when i sort of watch these kind of shows but i was generally creeped out when i saw you know the, the curtain being unveiled and him being in the little sort of box or whatever it was yeah, kind of kind of an under- iron almost like an iron lung Exactly. In the Iron Lung, I was like, wow, this is seriously disturbing. I love it because it's <clears throat> that disturbing that I actually enjoy it. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I will. I will uh, that, that's one of my, should we say, honorable mentions. All right. That's good. And, and one of the things that that whole sequence, I think it teased a little bit of why Mr. Nobody has an issue with the chief is that we find out that the chief had – come like showed up at at von fuchs's door at one point and shot von fuchs at least that's the the story we're presented through puppetry but uh but we don't know much more than that and maybe we'll get more in season two hopefully on that they kind of left that one hanging i thought no exactly exactly so hopefully we'll get more of it because it was a it was an interesting story and plus i think we want to know what the uh the, the deal is why Mr. Nobody is so hates him so much, or why he he has this animosity towards uh, right. towards uh, the chief. Yeah, we, I think there's I think there's still some material there to be mined at least for uh, whenever um, Mr. Nobody returns on Doom Patrol. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, so anything else? Anybody's looking forward to on season two? Hopefully. Well, I'm, Jesse, you do you have any? Is there are there any things you're looking forward to particularly? You know. I, I'm kind of curious to see where they're going to go. Um, I hope they do not, and I would be shocked if they turned into a more standard superhero show. I I don't see that in their DNA. Uh, I'd like to know more about Jane's personas. Um, I'd like to see, you know, the relationships between the four continue to advance. Um, I'm curious to see the chief's daughter and where that is. Yeah, well, obviously we're going to get more of Dorothy Spinner, I'm sure. And they're probably now that they'll have to cast somebody. I uh, know we kind of got her teased, but, you know, from the back. And so you couldn't see her face. And uh, we'll see. But uh, we'll see who they cast for that role. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking personally, I'm thinking we're going to – and I, we talked about this. That I, I'm hoping that we'll get to see a proper brotherhood of evil. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see the brain and Monsieur Mala from the original brotherhood of evil. Um, they kind of tease them a little bit, both of them, by mentioning them and whatnot. Uh, I think we'll get to see maybe another classic Doom Patrol villain from the 60s, General Immortus, who Ooh. I think is going to be connected to the Immortus Project. And we'll probably find out some more information about uh, the chief's efforts in his quest for immortality to learn more about that so that he could stay alive so that he could protect Dorothy and keep her safe. Good. So we'll, I'm seeing we'll, – and uh, I'm personally, as a Morrison fan, I'm hoping we'll see – because there's plenty more weird Doom Patrol villains from Morrison's run left in the box. So mm -hmm. I want to I see Mr. Nobody create his Brotherhood of Dada, and I want to see uh, Red Jack, who is a, essentially a version of Jack the Ripper that Morrison came up with. And I want to see the ultimate big bad of the um, – maybe like a season three or so. Um, the candle maker, who's like the the kind of the big bad of Morrison's final story run in Doom Patrol, who's who's a rarely nasty piece of work. So uh, we'll see, and uh, that's just kind of my personal hopes. So we'll see. All right. Uh, anything else about this first season before we uh, kind of wrap up here? No, I can't think of anything. All right, uh, Nick. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I would say I think we, we pretty much have, uh, have said everything that needs to be said. I, uh, I'm always 100 percent satisfied with this first season, really looking forward to season two. And uh, I'm sure it'll be just as good. And I'm sure they'll surprise us just as much as they did on this first r uh, run around. So I think we're all probably kind of general consensus that this season was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, and absolutely. And, I don't... And, and, and better than anybody expected. Yeah. And I think you had. I think I was the most surprised compared to you that because I just was going in there with no expectation. And I think you are just so surprised that, oh, my goodness, I can't believe they're doing this. I am getting yeah. Danny the Street on, the, yeah. on TV. I, I, I think you're, yeah, you were coming up with no expectations. Yeah. And I'm coming up with, you know, the, from the approach that my expectations were met and exceeded yeah. in a lot of ways. Which is amazing because I knew how much you love his writing and you love you you have a soft place in your heart for the yeah. storyline. So well, he's great. one of, he's one of my major influences as a writer. Yeah. So so in this run was uh, yeah as as a writer it's it 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 helped my form a lot of uh, how I write my stories and approach things and characters and whatnot. So uh, Nick, how about you? How about you? Did uh, did are you kind of like with Jesse that it kind of you didn't expect much going in and, and it kind of blew you blew you away a little bit well i will say yes because i i having not having so much background knowledge on the doom patrol i really didn't know what to expect it really was um a total surprise i i didn't know you know what i'd be getting into and it was just an incredible gift i have to say just because the fact that there is not i couldn't really say there's anything like this on tv at the moment because it's, it's just so different from anything else I've seen. And so I, uh, I definitely was incredibly happy. And it made me want to say, when, once the last episode was over, is I can't wait for season two to roll around. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah. So uh, this doesn't make you want to go back and actually check out more Grant Morrison comics of Doom Patrol. That for sure. I de my, that was actually on my to-do list. Once I, I finished this, I said to myself, <laughs> now I'm going to go just as I did the Doctor Who marathon from 63 to 2018. Oh, nice. I'm going to do the same thing with this. Well, you got Doom Patrol Very volume nice. two, volume two, number 19 through 63 to read. So that's that's like 44 comics right there. So uh, plenty for you to to sit back and enjoy. And I uh, I hardly recommend picking up the big brick, the Doom Patrol omnibus. That, that could probably kill somebody if you wanted to with it because it's so <laughs> ridiculously heavy, but um, uh, highly recommended. So anybody wants anybody looking for some Doom Patrol to kind of get them through the off season, obviously I definitely recommend uh, going on DC. You could go on DC Universe because hey, you're already paying for the service, so you might as well read the comics, right? And uh, checking those out, and it weighs a lot less than the Brick Omnibus. I'll say Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Your iPad's a little lighter than that. All right. Um, 
Uh, Titans Tower news before we sign off. Um, just real quick, I just kind of wanted to mention that Jesse and I, um, because with uh, Doom Patrol ending, and it's probably going to be a little while before Titans Season 2, that uh, he and I are kind of – we're going to kind of uh, close up shop temporarily on Titan Talk. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back around October, I'm guessing, for Season 2. But in the meantime, he and I are going to be talking Krypton Season 2 on another podcast for the Southgate Media Group, the Fandom Zone podcast, which uh, I've mentioned here and there. And uh, Karen and I, uh, Karen Lindsay and I used to do that podcast. We ended that kind of in November 18 when uh, Karen sadly has had some health problems. As some of you know, she's been going through MS and a horrible condition. And um, she's having some issues with her medication. And she's also having some technology issues. So um, Jesse has been kind enough to uh, agree to um, – Join me there on Phantom Zone, and we'll talk Krypton for probably the next 10 weeks or so. And uh, then we'll probably come right back for Titan Season 2 when that picks up on October. So I think that should work out great. So hopefully, I'm asking uh, if you enjoy Jesse and I, what we do here, please check us out on Phantom Zone Podcast. We just recorded our Krypton Season 1 review earlier today. And that's going to be Episode 153 of the Phantom Zone, and hopefully we'll get that posted shortly within the coming week. And uh, in the meantime, um, uh, Jesse, is there uh, anything you'd like to add about uh, our taking on Krypton? Yeah, I, mean, um, I really so. think we, we – um, if you haven't watched Krypton, I think it's definitely worth it. Um, Sci-Fi Channel replayed it, but since you have DC Universe, you can watch them online and then Sci-Fi Channel coming up – as we were talking about this, this week will be the new season. Uh, right. Definitely, definitely uh, works. It's a, it's a great series, and um, they've done some creative things. Um, coming up on, uh, you can hear Charles and I talk about uh, Doctor Who. You mm-hmm. can even Nix uh, join them. Uh, 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 next up everywhere. Yeah, yes, yeah next do- up everywhere. Yes. Yeah, we. Yeah, we talked the enemy of the world, and hopefully we'll be getting that up shortly. Yes. So, good times, yeah. good times. <laughs> Absolutely. It was, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that, Nick. So, yeah. Okay. So uh, if you enjoy Nick's work, yeah, check us out on Next Stop Everywhere that Jesse and I also do for yes. Southgate Media. And, uh, and Jesse, where else can they reach you on the interwebs? So I am still doing Set Lusting Bruce, the Bruce Springsteen podcast I do. Uh, we are um, – I'm back recording new episodes uh, so uh, we are up to over 300 episodes uh, from fans around the world. And once again, DJ Nick was nice enough to join me and talk about his musical journey. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. You can find me um, at um, on uh, Facebook on under Louisville. Texas, if you want to search, because there are more than one Jesse Jackson. Charles, where can they find you? Uh, well, they can find me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine or at Charles Skaggs on Instagram. I ple- definitely appreciate that. Uh, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio. Or my blog, Geeky Things. If that'll work. Come on. Uh, damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Titan Talk, uh, all kinds of uh, Titans, Doom Patrol news, uh, DC Universe, news of my other podcasts I do for Southgate Media, including, of course, uh, um, you know, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, the Fandom Zone podcast that we're now doing with Jesse as we talk Krypton, and, of course, Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast that I do with Zan Sprouse, wife of comic book artist Chris Sprouse, where we talk about all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, etc., etc. So if you enjoy talking uh, those topics, if you're kind of that offbeat, Doom Patrol, quirky kind of person, you kind of dig that stuff, uh, please check us out on Ghostwood. And uh, Nick, where can they find you and all of your wonderful work? Uh, well, uh, to use the musical segue there, if you are fans of country music, be it traditional or today's country music, you can catch us on the Whiskey and Cigarettes Show. To do that, all you have to do is visit our website. That's whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. That will link you to all our social media and where you can tune into the show, be it FM, AM or net. 
Excellent. So um, now, uh, yeah, please do that, everybody, because uh, Nick's obviously great. Uh, he's a, he has a lot of great insights, and uh, we just love talking to him. And he's so kind and always uh, has such wonderful things to say about us, even though we, we have, we're not paying him for that. So somehow that – I don't know how that works out. I mean I keep expecting to have him write a check at some point. <laughs> I, I was waiting for the PayPal transfer. It hasn't come uh, through oh, yet. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Maybe, or if you're waiting for the EFT, maybe we'll do electronic fund transfer. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it's always a pleasure. You, know, you, take, to be able you to... take PayPal. Yes. yes, indeed. Yeah, PayPal, PayPal always works. All nice right. and easy. Yeah, All but right. thanks again for having me on, guys. It's always a pleasure to talk anything with you because you are both excellent hosts and you're so passionate about what you do. So uh, I definitely uh, always have a great time. All right. So uh, in the meantime, if you want to get uh, keep in touch with us here on Titan Talk, of course, you can reach us on Twitter at Titan Talk Cast or on Facebook at Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. And uh, you can drop us a line if you want, titantalkcast at gmail.com, because even though uh, we may not be recording episodes for a while, uh, still going to get the emails, and uh, we can save them up over the summer and uh, until we get back and to talk about them. So you reach us at titantalkcast at gmail.com. Uh, otherwise, we're probably just um, – I'll probably cry and work in uh, an episode – uh, of Young Justice Outsiders Part Two with Phil Parrish from the um, the uh, oh, what's is it the Capes and Lunatics podcast, where he and I will be uh, talking uh, the back half of Young Justice Outsiders and episodes fourteen through twenty six. But uh, other than that, um, we'll just come back in October and we'll talk Titan season two and uh, what looks to be an interesting. Uh, adaptation hopefully of the judas contract in titan season two which they still need to wrap up the trigon storyline though yeah so <laughs> we go so you got a lot to do guys and hopefully you're up to the task this time so doom patrols raised the bar really really high it really so, has hasn't it yes it has so uh titans time to step your game up as we all like mm -hmm. to say uh, you got a lot to do. You got a lot to uh, make up for, I think, for that first season. So hopefully you can get on track and Doom Patrol hopefully showed you how to do it. Absolutely. So, all right. So, Nick, again, once again, thank you for joining us. You're always welcome to join us whenever we have a podcast. And uh, we love talking to you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both so much for your time. And as I said, it's, it's ever a pleasure to uh, to spend the, the time talking to you and shooting the breeze over what we the shows we love so much. Excellent. And uh, Jesse, any final words before we sign off? Just thank you, Nick. Thank you, uh, Charles. It's always a joy talking to you guys. And uh, I agree. Uh, you know, Nick, just anytime you've got something you want to share, uh, I'll throw you on set Lessing Bruce and uh, we'll have fun talking <laughs> music, okay? Always a good time. Yes, indeed. Thank you. All, All right. right. So, deal. everybody, thanks again for listening to us here at Titan Talk. Uh, like I said, we'll be talking uh, maybe Young Justice Outsiders a little bit, and then we'll be back hopefully in October for Titan Season 2. So we'll see you next time, and thank you for listening to Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. Goodbye, everybody.